welcome everybody to the Rally for Democracy. 33.5 million of us voted in the 2016 referendum. And unlike all other votes, uh, we've not actually had this one fully honoured. Now there's a political earthquake. Everything is questioned, even the idea of what democracy means. So as Democrats, whichever way you voted, whatever political party you're a member of, or campaign group, or volunteer group, or even if you don't actually do any politics until tonight coming here, we actually have all gathered to sort out the democratic from the undemocratic and ask what the main problems are in our democracy today. And as Democrats, what should we rally together for? And to work out these questions, and other questions about democracy that all of you may have too, I want to introduce you to the speakers, all of whom come from very different political backgrounds. To start with, Kate Hoey MP is the Labour MP for Vauxhall since 1989. And in the Labour government, she was a minister for sport. She voted for Brexit in the 2016 referendum as well, and was one of four Labour MPs to support the government in defeating an amendment calling for a post-Brexit customs union. Also to my right, the Right Honourable Gisela Stewart was the Labour MP for Birmingham Eggbaston for 20 years until last year. In the first Blair government, she was a health minister and later served on the Defence, the Foreign Affairs and later on the Intelligence and Security Committee. In 2016, she chaired Vote Leave, the officially des designated referendum campaign, and since leaving Parliament, she chairs Change Britain. Also to my right, Councillor Brendan Chilton, I'm very pleased to welcome is the Labour councillor for Stanhope in Ashford and a former parliamentary candidate. He was head of the Labour Leave campaign during the EU referendum and now heads Labour Future, one of the fastest growing online Labour support groups in the country. To my left here, Minira Meza was the Deputy Mayor of London for Culture and Education under Boris Johnson. She now works in the arts and is also a contributing editor of All in Britain, a new platform to promote fresh thinking about race, culture and identity. And finally, Mick Hume is currently editor-at-large at Spike, the political online magazine. He's the author of the book Revolting, How the Establishment Are Undermining Democracy and What They're Afraid Of. Also, the book Trigger Warning is the Fear of Being Offensive, Killing Free Speech. And he writes for newspapers from the Sunday Times and The Sun. So, each speaker will speak for seven minutes on what is the main problem facing Democrats today and what democratic principle and action should we rally around. And I'm very pleased to introduce first Kate Hoey, MP. Thank you very much for that. I, I, I take it there's not many people who voted <laughs> to stay in the EU in the room. Yeah. And I, actually, it's really nice to come to a big meeting of people who support democracy and therefore support automatically or should be supporting the result of the referendum. Uh, because if you live in London and you read the Evening Standard, you sometimes think you're the only person who actually uh, honours the referendum. Um, and I just would say that I, I, you know, I, I was one of four, well, five if we include Kelvin Hopkins. We didn't vote with the government. We voted against an amendment put by Tory rebel remainers who wanted to stay in the customs union. And, you know, I had a choice, voting for something that I totally, totally disagreed with, or going into a division where there would be lots of people from other parties, particularly Conservative Party. No choice in a matter like that if you believe in democracy. And if you believe in sticking to what you've said, and for many, many years I've made it very clear, my views on the... EU. But talking about democracy, which is what you know, tonight is, is all about, and I do really congratulate um, the organisation Vote Democracy for organising this, we must remember 17.4 million people voted to leave the European Union. And that wasn't just you know, an ordinary vote like a general election, because to get 17.4 million people, which was the biggest ever vote, the biggest mandate for anything, uh, that we'd voted for in the past really does make that stand out. And just 
If we look back just a few years ago, there were people who were saying all the time, isn't it dreadful how few people vote? Isn't it terrible, this disconnect between people out there? You know, they use the word ordinary people. I try always to say inverted commas, ordinary people. But isn't it terrible, you know, the disconnect? What can we do about people who don't like politicians and think they're all the same and politics is just awful? And then we get people who, despite the main leaders of the main established parties, the three main political parties, the CBI, the Bank of England, Barack Obama, <laughs> even, even coming down to my constituency, um, Bob Geldof. <laughs> Despite all of them, all of them telling people and giving out the most amazing amounts of fear and, and scaremongering, people came out in their millions to, de to defy that what I saw very much was a cozying up of the establishment to actually try to thwart people's views. And we saw that during the campaign, and we needn't go into the campaign now, but some of the, the things that went on and the, and the lies and the distortions. But we saw it immediately after the campaign. And I think one of my greatest um, annoyances at myself, really, is that because I am a Democrat, and we woke up the next morning having won the referendum, absolutely delighted. And of course, I think those of us who were on the side to leave then took our eye off the ball. We actually did think we'd won. We were so thrilled at having gone through that campaign, despite everything, and seeing people who had never, ever voted in their lives. And one of the things that I was struck with as I did rallies all around the country was people coming up to me at the end of those rallies, literally some of them in tears to me as a Labour MP and saying, we have been driven away from your party on this issue and now we are coming back and we are going to vote Labour this time. We're going to vote for, uh, against staying, we want to stay out of the EU, we want to get out and then we might think of coming back to Labour. But they saw a Labour MP, yes, I went on platforms with people that some people in this room would, would not want to go on platforms, but I find it I find absolutely right that in a democracy, we should be able to work with people who feel the same way as we do on particular issues. And I find those people humbled almost by the fact that they were determined to get their, their vote listened to. They'd never voted before, many of them, and they said they were so pleased that they thought this time their vote might count. And we said to them, and I always said at the end of the rally, make sure you vote, make sure you find one other person, even just one other person, who wasn't going to vote and will come out to vote to leave. And that's what happened. And you know, now since that, of course, we've seen that we have be, had, had all these uh, um, big, big money people coming in to turn and try and turn the referendum result. And that's, you know, that's not by accident. The campaign to overturn the result of the referendum, I believe, started the morning after, when we were actually celebrating. People were beginning to plot, and they were beginning to make, uh, 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 to decide how they could stop uh, re and re not respect the referendum result anymore. The, we know what they want to achieve now. We know that they want to make people feel disillusioned, depressed, uh, angry perhaps too, and with this idea that somehow it doesn't really matter. We can change the vote, we can go back, and we can get another chance to vote again. They want to drive public engagement down again because they don't like, I think, many people in this country, the fact that people did come out and vote and say no. They would love, in a way, people to go back to that kind of cynicism. And the one thing that they know is that if this result was to be overturned, or more, more importantly, we were to have another vote on it, that that actually would make people incredibly cynical about democratic politics and about the fact that they had voted and now their vote was being ignored by the elected politicians. And I've been very disappointed in Parliament itself, in the way some MPs have almost, uh, in a disparaging fashion, implied that anyone who voted to leave just didn't understand it. You, you realise none of you really understood if you voted to leave. You were conned. 
And, and, and that has had also, I think, a, a big effect on people who did vote for the first time. But I think also we need to remember that outside London, things are very different. And outside London, I see no sign of people's views and attitudes changing. And I think that we have to respect the fact that what we have done is basically say, and it, it's very, very simple. We've simply said that we want to be like the rest of the world who are outside the European Union. We want to be a democracy that allows our politicians to make the mistakes, to do the ridiculous things, to do the good things when they can, and if we don't like them, we vote them out. The European Union has not allowed that to happen, whatever people say. And I believe that in the end, we have to be willing to actually walk away from those negotiations. We have to be able to say, we are not prepared to water down the demands of the Leave vote, of what people voted for. And what has been so shocking is that within the government, elements of government from the very beginning have not had the courage and the, uh, the ability or the willingness to actually stand up for our country, to actually say we're a proud country, we're a big country, we're the fifth economy in the world. We know that we can, that we can handle things extremely well. They have not been prepared to do that and they have not, in fact, been prepared to even come out, the Prime Minister over and over again has not been prepared to come out and actually say there is a great future outside the European Union. So I am concerned that we, need, we may need to actually say we were prepared to walk away. I just want to end by reading um, one little bit from, I've, got, I've had hundreds of letters from people in the last month or so, all people from all over the country, very, very depressed about what's happening. And that's why these kind of rallies and what we're doing with the Leave Mean Leave campaign all around the country are so important. We have to raise the morale of people again and let them not feel that we're deserting them, that sort of London and the intellectual elite and the establishment has, is, is ignoring them. And this, this lady, she is, I think she, was, she said she was 85 and she said, my husband and I support Brexit and are, we're both overjoyed on the 23rd of June 2016 when Leave won the referendum. But I remember my husband saying, he's since died actually since that, I remember my, my husband saying during the referendum campaign that if by a miracle Leave were to win, we would never be allowed to leave. I've feared this from then and sadly it looks as though it's been proved right. We must not allow people like that to be uh, ignored and we must make sure that with, between all of us and our different views and aspects of democracy that we honour the vote and that we invoke democracy now. Thank you. Thank you. Gisela. I'm Gisela Stewart, and uh, the greatest sin apparently I committed two years ago was not campaigning to leave the European Union. It was not going out on a bus. Uh, it was not being out, being with Boris Johnson. It was being seen to be enjoying myself being out <laughs> with Boris Johnson. <laughs> and it was really quite extraordinary. That was the major charge. They kept saying, you looked as if you were having fun. <laughs> And, and I was trying to sort of get them to the point where I say, you know, it is not incompatible to, 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 to go out and fight for what you believe in and enjoy it. And uh, I just want to, because I don't ever really think I've had a chance to, to really to pay tribute to, to Kate, because I have to tell you that doing Wembley Arena is dead easy. You know, you have no idea whether this is 500 people or 5,000 people out there. It's just a black room and nobody answers back. Whereas going to village halls and going to meetings like this, that's the real one-to-one -one battles, particularly if it's a hostile audience. And, uh, you know, I may have got more television coverage, but I had the easy gig. And the really hard one was Brendan and he was Kate and going out there and, 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 and fighting and, stand, and, and taking the hostility. Because there was, the, you know, there was tremendous hostility. And we, we're, uh, one of the dangers of democracy at the moment is that... Uh, 
I don't know any of, any of you saw that Tracy Ullman sketch about the self-help group, where they're going to say, oh my God, there are really other people out there who don't think like I do, you know? And we've now got to the position that not thinking the way you do equals, you have just offended me. Uh, and that, I think, is, is, is really bad. And I just want to come back and say a few things about the nature of democracy, because we are a danger, uh, we are, we're really risking forgetting what it's all about. Uh, there's, there's always this spectrum which goes, on the one hand, it's mob rule. You know, that whoever is, shouts loudest gets what they want. And I think we've all accepted that that's not the right way of going about it. And then there's bureaucratic tyranny, which may be by far more efficient, maybe straight, straightforward, and that's not right either. So somewhere in the middle, we find a way of negotiating these competing demands. And then people who broadly believe in similar things, they tend to come together in political parties. And these political parties, you check who's got more support in general elections. And then they go off and meet in places called the House of Commons, where they do a job. And the job they do is represent the various interests, negotiate, find common solutions, seek consensus, and, f and work towards implementing the mandate they were given. And the danger we've got now is that, A, people have forgotten about that that is the job of politicians. The job of politicians in Parliament is not to pick a fight with the voters. And that is what they've done as a result of this referendum. They've said there may have been a majority out, of there, out there to have said one thing, but there are more of us in here who think differently. And therefore, it is our job to show you the errors of your way. Well, it is an approach, but folks, let's just be really careful with that one. Because if you think about uh, our system of parliamentary democracy, yes, it usually works around political parties and all those things, but ever so often, the politicians say, here's a really big question, question to which we want you to give us a direct answer. That's what they did with that referendum. And curiously, when we had a referendum on AV, nobody challenged the outcome. When we had a referendum in Wales, where you had a turnout just over 50%, a majority of 0.7%, nobody questioned it. Scottish referendum, well, you know, it was hard fought, but nobody turned around and said, the Scottish voters were totally irrational. They had no idea what they voted for. And yet we come to this referendum, and it is the first time in my memory where the politicians refused to implement the mandate of a franchise. And I would like us to rethink this and say, the British people in the last seven years, on those three referendum, had taken extremely rational decisions on how they wish to be governed. We won't change the election system. We want to keep the United Kingdom together and Scotland doesn't leave. And we want to leave the European Union. And yet, we have a discourse which kind of says, it's an illness which needs to be treated. I mean, I, I went on breakfast television with Rachel Johnson, and, and, I, and I love her to bits, but Rachel used the, the argument for a second referendum. She said, well, just imagine you've decided to kill yourself. Uh, so you've, you've, booked the, you, you, you've, booked the, you've booked the ticket to Switzerland, uh, and, and now you suddenly decide, no, 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 I'm going to live. Are you still going to fly to Switzerland just because you've decided once to go? And I say, you're still treating the decision if it was an illness to which somehow we have to find a cure. Whereas really what we have to do is find the, a, a mechanism to implement it. Because, I don't know how many of you listened to the Today program with Mervyn King on Monday. Uh, to the great credit of Mervyn King during the referendum campaign, even though it, it was clear to those of us who knew him, that he thought it was a perfectly rational decision to leave. He remained silent uh, because he thought he owed it to his role as the former uh, uh, governor of the Bank of England. I wish the incumbent governor of the Bank of England had, <laughs> had equally paid tribute to his responsibility of an office. Uh, but, but Mervyn said something very interesting on the Today programme. He said, I ask myself the simple question, how can a country the sixth largest economy in the world, one with a reputation for political stability, one with a tradition and reputation for administrative capacity, get itself to the state we're in today. 
And that takes you to the, the strands which are now coming together and are causing us a problem. There is the merit or otherwise of the vote to leave. We can argue over this, but we can't rerun the referendum. We had the referendum. The rules were agreed beforehand. Nobody mentioned a second referendum in the original legislation. If you want two referendums, then mention it in the legislation when you hold it. So we had an Article 50 vote. We had a general election where both political parties promised to implement the result. And yet, we got ourselves to this position where we are led to believe it is just too difficult. And you good people better go home and see the, the, the errors of your way. To which I say, given that we are a politically stable country, one with administrative skills, me thinks you don't want to implement it. And that's the bit which I think we're up against, and that's the bit which we've got to fight. Thank you. Brendan. Can I just begin by thanking, the, again, the organisers of this rally for democracy? I don't think it could come at a better time because democracy in this country is under threat from people who will not accept the outcome of the referendum, which was free, not entirely fair, but it was free, and we won, so they should accept it. It's also a great uh, pleasure and a privilege to be on the stage uh, with Kate, uh, who I worked with very closely in the referendum, and also Giza, who was chair of Vote Leave. She led the campaign to get us out, really. And I think, particularly for Labour MPs, the decision they took to campaign to leave was bold, and it was brave, and it was very courageous, given the enormous odds against them in the Labour Party. <laughs> And, and even more so since that referendum, because of the personal abuse uh, that's been hurled at them, I think their treatment has been disgusting, and I think we should show tonight our solidarity with them as they continue to campaign for what we all voted for, to leave the European Union. So give them a round of applause. <laughs> So I just want to go back to that referendum. It was leave versus remain. It wasn't leave versus halfway house. It wasn't leave versus soft Brexit. It wasn't leave versus a customs arrangement. It wasn't leave versus full access. It was leave versus remain. And we won. It was a David and Goliath struggle. On our side, we had little old dears in village halls holding fundraisers. We had people giving up their evenings after work to leaflet. We had volunteers donating five pounds, ten pounds. And on the other side, we had Obama. We had the IMF, every party leader, the TUC, the CBI, banks, multinational corporations, big business, and they lost. And they should learn that they lost. But it was ever thus, the powerful never give in. But I think we need to remember that since then we've had a general election. The government, both main parties, as a matter of fact most of the parties represented in the House of Commons, promised to accept the outcome of the referendum. The government propaganda leaflet that we all chipped in for, that was sent out, <laughs> promised that if we voted to leave it would be implemented. And to see now the disgusting sight of some members of parliament standing there telling us we didn't know what we were voting for. Fellow racists, fellow thickos, fellow little Englanders, we didn't know what we were voting for. Well, we did. And you've been given an instruction, get on and deliver it. Don't tell us we were wrong. Now, since that referendum, we've had a almost daily hourly splurge of Project Fear. It is back in full force. We've had certain airlines telling us they won't fly to the Republic of Ireland if we continue on this programme of leaving. We've had our own government telling us we've got to stockpile bottles of water. One MP told us that Love Island might not continue <laughs> if we leave. And unfortunately, it was a Labour MP that said it. Um, we've had government scare tactics from our own supposedly Brexit government. We've got the House of Lords. As this event is about democracy, I would suggest 
that we have taken control or in the process of taking control from a bunch of unelected officials in Brussels, why are we giving it to a bunch of unelected individuals in Westminster? <laughs> Goodbye. We should get rid of them, in my opinion, as part of the democratic revival of this nation. And Andy Burnham, uh, the former Labour Shadow Home Secretary and current Mayor of Manchester, gave a great speech the other day where he spoke about devolution to the regions of this country, to the city regions. And Brexit isn't just about taking control from Brussels and giving it to Westminster. We should be pushing power further outwards and downwards into communities. Because Brexit was not just a vote against Westminster, uh, Brussels, it was just as much a vote, I think, against Westminster. And we can perhaps discuss that as we go along. And of course, we've got Brussels. Good old Barnier apparently refusing to turn up to negotiations because he's not very happy with the proposals the government's putting forward. We've got dear old Mr Juncker when he's sober uh, commenting <laughs> on things that's going on in this country. The disgraceful behaviour in Northern Ireland by some EU officials trying to bring back the difficulties that that community have had over many years and the behaviour on the border is frankly disgusting. And on that basis alone we should walk away from the negotiations because they're no friend. And we have also got the resurgent Remain campaign, the People's Vote or the People's Pledge, whatever they're called. Very clever language. Sounds optimistic, doesn't it? The People's Vote. Who could disagree with that? It is a disguise and it is a con. We should call it what it is, the second referendum campaign. But not just that, it's the establishment referendum campaign. It's the corporation's <laughs> referendum campaign. It's the Remain Media referendum campaign. It's the loser's referendum. That's what it is. They can't accept what's happened. And their attempts at the moment, their entryism, and their attempts to infiltrate the Labour Party in an attempt to try and get us to change our policy position I say to any Labour member in this hall and anyone that might watch the video clip afterwards, ignore it. If we go down this route, we face obliteration in the 70% of Labour constituencies that voted to leave. And the 5 million Labour voters that supported us in 2017 who also supported leave may look for a second home. If the hummus latte vote wants to go down that route, they can, but I want to keep our core vote with us because they're the bedrock of our movement and we shouldn't be giving them that uh, particular salute with two uh, meta, not meta tassels, fingers here. Uh, I don't think we should be doing that. They're our core vote, they voted to leave and they're good Labour people and they should be respected. So, Giza's touched on this and Kate's touched on this. For the first time, in our political history, certainly in our memory, we have a situation where we have got an alliance between parliamentarians, big media, big business, some celebrities, coming together saying that we were wrong, that our vote didn't count, we didn't know what we were voting for, we need to go away and do it again. If this happened in any other country in the world, we would be looking at that and we would be saying, a bit dodgy what's going on there, not quite right, not implementing the will of the people. This isn't democracy, but it's happening here in full guise. It's not happening in secret. It's happening before our very eyes. As Democrats, we should stand up to it, reject it, honour the vote. We're leaving the European Union. Thank you. Manira, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you um, from me as well to the organisers for uh, inviting me to speak tonight. It's a great privilege to be on a panel with people who I admire very much and who have done so much to get us to this, this point and have been 
campaigning for leaving the EU for a very long time, much longer than I've um, been involved. So it's a great honor to be speaking alongside them. And uh, it's also fantastic to be in a room with comrades. Um, I work in the art sector, so I'm used to being a minority in any case. But um, particularly in the last two years, I felt very much, um, uh, with a few exceptions in the room, um, my artist fellows amongst you, um, that, that I've been very much alone. So it's great to be uh, uh, amongst you all, um, this, this band of brothers. We are the nucleus in London uh, of, the, of the Leave vote. I am asked quite often these days whether I still stand by my decision to leave um, the EU, my decision to vote for the UK to leave in 2016. And I'm usually asked by people who voted Remain, and they often have a very hopeful tone in their voice <laughs> when they ask me, and uh, they hope that by now, finally, I should have seen the light and that somehow I would like to reverse... Um, the decision that I've, you know, realised it's now finally going to be um, a disaster uh, and, and let's back out now. And um, what I say to them is, is this, that as each day goes by, as we hear more and more about how badly the negotiations are going, we hear how truculent the EU is being, we hear how, how indecisive our government is being and how this campaign for a people's vote or a second referendum is building up, I think, thank God... We voted to leave on June the 23rd because it was absolutely the right decision. Not only because we're leaving a dysfunctional superstate and an anti-democratic institution, but I think that vote exposed for the first time truly what was going on in British society and the appalling anti-democratic rot that had set into our own political culture. It was like lifting a rock and seeing what was going on underneath, this teeming mass of politicians, of institutions, of commentators, of so-called academics and intellectuals, all telling us, informing us, that the vote that we had uh, made, the decision we'd made, which was the largest mandate in, in history in this country, was a giant mistake, and that democracy is dangerous, and that the decision that we had made was so unacceptable to them that they would do anything that they can to overturn it. And if you'd asked me five years ago whether these kinds of attitudes towards the public, towards voters, could be so old-fashioned and Victorian, I simply couldn't have believed it. I wouldn't believe that people would be so open and honest about the fact that the public made a decision and that they want to ignore it. In the 21st century, we are standing here in a situation where bankers, politicians, artists, academics are telling us that people who are not educated should not be allowed to vote. It's genuinely, and Rachel Johnson has said uh, similar things many, many times, uh, and so have others. And these are the very same people, by the way, who brought us such great hits as the financial crisis of 2008, <laughs> who in all their infinite wisdom could not predict the collapse of the major banks like Lehman Brothers or RBS, and actually who couldn't even predict Brexit itself. But they dare to tell us that they're the educated ones who have the wisdom and the judgment um, to make these decisions. And I think what the last two years has shown us is that democracy is a very fragile thing, that we can't take it for granted. And I was uh, thinking the other day about how uh, it's a legal requirement now in schools that they have to teach British values. How could you honestly expect a school child to believe that democracy is a British value when there's a massive campaign now going on to have a second referendum? I mean, how could you possibly explain that to a school child? It's obvious to even a 10-year-old, and that's a contradiction in terms. And yet here we are um, uh, uh, being told um, that this is um, the fulfilment of democracy. I was thinking that maybe we should ask Ofsted to go and visit the offices of Gina Miller and <laughs> Alistair Campbell so that they could explain it to them. I wish we could just blame the EU for this extinguishing of the spirit of democracy in this country, but that would be too easy. And I think we all know that the problem is far closer to home. It's a homegrown uh, phenomenon. And in truth, we probably ought to look to our own political elite, present company accept, uh, uh, accepted, um, and to the kind of intellectual classes who for many years have peddled this idea that the ordinary people, working class people, uh, are too stupid, too gullible, too easily duped by the Murdoch press, 
to know what they're voting for, to know how to vote in their own interests. And I'm a child of the 80s. I remember uh, the discussions about uh, Thatcher and how could it be that the working classes had dared to vote for her. And whatever you might think of Thatcher, um, that was certainly um, the view that was expressed at the time. And on every single uh, issue where the elite disagrees with the working class, it's always explained as a mistake of false consciousness or a, a kind of act of uh, corruption or intervention from Russia. It's always somebody else who was making the decision. It's never the people because how could they possibly vote this way? But I think what's really breathtaking right now, and Gisela pointed to this, is that they dare to suggest that the vote doesn't even count. Because no matter how much people hated Thatcher, I don't think anyone really suggested that she didn't win the election. That's the extraordinary thing, that they are actually saying that we disagree with this vote and therefore it shouldn't even stand. And I think that is something that is new. So I don't think the EU has invented this crisis or that the referendum was the beginning of it. I think that the rot had set in far earlier. But it has brought it into sharp relief and it has exacerbated that very deep antipathy that we're seeing now towards democracy. I have two reasons now for believing that we must leave the EU. The first is that we must honour the vote and we must respect the democratic decision that was made by this country. We have to stick to it. Whatever people's individual views of leaving the EU, and, and we will all have different views, we did make a decision, we have to stick to that. I think the second reason is that for me, Brexit was never just about Britain. It was always about a bigger question about Europe as a continent and what will happen to the EU in the future. I wish our neighbours and our allies in the EU member states well, but I do think the EU needs to reform. And I think that Brexit is the pressure um, that will facilitate that. It's not the only thing, but it's very important, I think, for the rest of Europe, that they see that Brexit can happen and that it can be a success. So I think we are doing something which is uh, uh, for a much bigger cause uh, and which is about making the case for national control over uh, our laws and our borders and our money and so on. Those arguing for a second referendum laughably call it a people's vote and I think Brendan's absolutely right. It's a complete um, uh, myth and a, a, a disgrace of language to call it that. Uh, and they really have been under a rock for the last two years to believe that this is what the people want. Uh, I don't know how they think they can uh, uh, convince, convince us that that's the case. And what they want to imply is that when the vote took place, it wasn't really the people. It was something else. It was someone else. And I think this really is Alice in Wonderland territory because we're now uh, uh, looking at a situation when people are simply denying the reality. And uh, I think that's deeply worrying for democracy. And in a curious reversal of what happens in most corrupt elections where the losing party pretends that it won, we now have a government that's pretending that it lost. And... <laughs> has basically spent the last two years apologising to Remainers, begging the EU to stay, essentially, in the EU on the same terms, and essentially wanting to maintain a status quo um, a scenario, which, of course, is absolutely not what we voted for. We voted for change. And it's like seeing the opposite of a coup, uh, where a government has essentially given up uh, on, its, on its own mission. I think it's a cop-out. Um, I will sum up, I promise. Um, my, my final point is, is this, that I think um, I have an aspiration for our broader political culture. I think we, we will leave the EU. I believe that we will. And that when we do, um, and people realise that it hasn't been a disaster and that all the predictions of, um, of economic collapse um, are not realised, I hope that as a country we will start to sober up and we will start to see um, that that kind of hysterical fear-mongering um, is something that should be treated with scepticism and that we will regard new ideas and, and difficult ideas um, with a degree of um, calm and uh, intelligence and we'd be much more measured about them. Um, and I think that, that that's incredibly um, important for uh, the future and the health of our um, political culture that, that we have a greater appetite for risk and for ideas, uh, and that we don't just shout them down uh, in an emotional and hysterical way. So I think this is important both for democracy, but also for reason itself, that we make the arguments that we don't descend into the kind of fear-mongering that our opponents um, have already done, um, and that we make a, a much more intelligent and reasoned case. Thank you.
and Mick. Thank you very much. I am delighted to be here tonight. I'm delighted that the meeting is focused on the defence of democracy because we need to remind ourselves and everybody else that that is what is at stake in this debate. It's very easy to lose sight of that amongst all the noise uh, that we hear uh, talking about everything other than uh, democracy when it comes to Brexit and leaving the EU. Um, the kind of project fear propaganda that we've uh, talked about, the suggestion that's made in all seriousness that um, Britain might be on the point of starvation because of a shortage of pre-packed sandwiches uh, after Brexit, um, that the French scallops will rise up from the sea and attack our fishermen, <laughs> and that planes will be falling from the sky, uh, no doubt accompanied by plagues of locusts and frogs and presumably Russian bloggers. <laughs> It's very easy to lose sight of it in all that, that what the, we are really talking about here, uh, all of that is distracting from the issue of popular democracy. From, as has been said, the biggest vote for anything in British political history. 17.4 million of us voted for Brexit. And we did not vote any lunatic scheme to try and leave the freedom-loving peoples of Europe behind. We left to leave the, anti the clutches of the anti-democratic European Union. Before Europe, and against the EU. It's a very simple concept that some people find, seem to find difficult uh, to grasp and imagine that somehow this is an anti-European argument, an anti-European uh, movement. If those 52% people's will, as expressed in that referendum, is denied, then by what standard do we claim to live in a democratic society at all? By what standard can Britain be a democracy if the expressed opinion of a majority can simply be ignored uh, uh, by the political uh, elite? Yet in our increasingly unrepresentative democracy, who actually speaks to the 52% in the political class? In Parliament, can you name me one party that is led by people who are on the side of the 52%, the Leavers? I can tell you there is one. The Democratic Unionist Party of Northern Ireland. <laughs> the much maligned, the much maligned, with some justification, Democratic Unionist Party of Northern Ireland is the voice of 52% of the British voting public. Every other party in Parliament is led by people who are on the side of the establishment's Remain campaign. We've got uh, Theresa May and her Remainiac Chancellor, um, who, uh, as has been suggested, basically go into negotiations as if we've lost a war uh, rather than won a referendum. Uh, it's like Germany in 1918, the way they, they conduct themselves in, the, in, in their negotiations with the EU. And we've got the Labour leadership. And all of them say we, we, we respect the referendum result. But, and this is, they're all, the, the buts are getting bigger. Jeremy Corbyn, I saw those people demonstrating for him outside the meeting, the NEC meeting the other day, with placards saying, Jeremy Corbyn, man of principle. <laughs> well, one of Jeremy Corbyn's lifelong principles was opposition to the EU. He carried Tony Benn's bag in that campaign for many, many years, until the one moment in his life when it actually mattered and he signed up to the establishment's Remain campaign. Unenthusiastically, quite quietly, but nevertheless, he was on that side uh, of, of the discussion. So no major political party speaks uh, for the 52%. Uh, percent. And that's a quite shocking uh, indictment, I think, of our increasingly unrepresentative representative uh, 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 democracy. The government has decided to forget the promise that was made at the time of the referendum, um, in that leaflet, where they told us, you won't remember this? By the way, it's, it's funny when they're, they're talking about all the money that was spent to somehow con us into voting leave. No one ever talks about the millions the government sent spending this to every household in the country, telling us why we had to vote Remain. And they promised us then, um, this is your decision. The government will implement what you decide. Instead of which, of course, the government has decided to try to implement what it wants, which is basically Remain by another name. And the Remain campaigner had been trying to undermine the result uh, since, the, since day one. You know, in the kind of all well through the looking glass world of political language today, you might even think it's the Remain elite who are actually the champions of democracy. They say we need to, we need to disrupt Brexit in order to defend parliamentary democracy. Now, parliamentary democracy is a very important thing to defend. And it might have occurred to them to try and offend it, defend it over the last 40 years when it was being pissed on by the European uh, 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 Union's laws. In fact, they only want to defend parliamentary democracy against the British people. They only want to defend parliamentary democracy against popular democracy. 
as expressed uh, in Brexit. And they talk about the people's vote, you know, as if the actual people's vote was somehow conducted by aliens and we need to have a rerun uh, to get some real people to vote. Let's have a second referendum on abolishing the House of Lords. I think that would be a very big step forward uh, for democracy uh, in our society. And if you want to see the real face of these so-called Democrats in the Remainer elite, I think we've got to go back and remember how they reacted to the referendum result in June 2016, with MPs of all parties talking about the Brexit vote being madness, the clear implication being that all Leave voters were loonies. With uh, the lovely Gina Miller, poster girl of the, of the Remain campaign, admitting that when she saw the referendum revo uh, result, she was physically sick. She was physically sick at the sight of revolting proletarian voters refusing to do as they were told uh, in the ballot box on referendum day. That's the real face uh, of these people. So we need to stand up for democracy in the face of all that. We are living a new politics now in Britain. It's no longer left against right that matters. The leave and adversities remain debate about democracy has cut right across all those lines. You know, I'm on the platform tonight, I'm very glad to be with Labour representatives. We've got our communist friends at the back with their No Deal uh, uh, t-shirts. But in, in generally in political life, I as an old lefty and a former editor of Living Marxism magazine, find myself having far more in common with Jacob Rees-Mogg on these questions. <laughs> than with 90% of Labour MPs or people who call themselves left-wing and socialists uh, in, the, in, 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 in modern Britain. And I think the dividing line now, it seems to me when it comes to the question of democracy, is are you prepared to countenance no deal? Are you prepared to countenance no deal? That is the dividing line which decides which side you are on in the great debate uh, about democracy. Because what are the alternatives? The EU is offering some kind of neo-colonial relationship to Britain uh, after a, a, a kind of semi-Brexit. The government's checkers sellout is just remain by another name. Being prepared to countenance no deal is the only way to stand up for democracy uh, in the here and now, it seems to me. And yet, um, what do we hear from our political leaders? Theresa May, asked to defend the idea of no deal, says it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. That's the kind of fighting talk we need that can inspire, <laughs> inspire the nation going forward. And Jeremy Corbyn, when he was asked the same question six, he had a lot of stick the other week for giving woolly answers to the same question six times about what he thought the consequences of Brexit would be. But one thing he made very clear, that Labour, and I quote, would not countenance a no-deal Brexit. Labour would not countenance a no deal Brexit. If you would not countenance no, de no deal, that means in the end, any deal will do. Whatever we are offered, we'll have to accept. If we're not going to countenance no deal, any deal will do. And we have to offer whatever, we're, uh, uh, um, whatever crumbs we're shoveled off their, off their table. It means that like the Tories, Labour is going to end up supporting something we might call remain uh, by another name. And I think um, no deal uh, is the only consistent position today to say that we're in favour of democracy in this country. And let's make no mistake, when we talk about democracy in Britain in 2018, it's Brexit or bust. So if we don't have Brexit, we don't have a chance of democracy. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Now it's over to you. Hands up. <laughs> Thank you. Ian Wilson, are we not frightening ourselves a little too much over the idea of the people's referendum? Because it would surely require a vote in Parliament to implement such a referendum, and that just ain't going to happen, is it? The numbers aren't there. I was wondering what kind of Brexit deal were you have said? Norway option, W2 rules, Canada plus, the kind of like policy kind of in the way that you're thinking about it. And also... Is the Tory party and Labour party become the party of Remain and Brexit, where you see like major UKIPers are joining Tories, major Remainers are joining Labour? Is that the battle, the next battle in the general election? That's what I was wondering. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Graham Pemberton. Um, I was wondering if the people on the panel are aware of a website called um, the Brexit Syndicate, which obviously is an anti-Brexit um, website, which um, says basically that some aspects of the Brexit campaign are being driven by like a right-wing conglomerate of um, big business, the right-wing media, non-domiciled tax exiles. There is a very unpleasant side to the Brexit campaign, obviously not people in this room, obviously, but, uh, and I just wondered if they are aware of that website and what their reaction to it is. Um, and also a second question, is there any reality in the idea of, with a no deal, all the project fear stuff about um, queues of lorries, do we think that we can have a friction-free, easy way out with a no deal? One of the things that I um, was thinking about, the gentleman on the, my right, um, I heard his talk in full, and he's uh, mentioned a few times the word no deal. And um, in semantics, to use something which prefaced by no, it's like a, a negative. And I'm wondering, as uh, Brexiteers and people, those of us who want to leave, can we reframe the some other phrase which is not as ne ne negative, negative? Because no deal is a great, is a great thing to do. It's not as good as having a, a cooperative deal. But I'm wondering if we can, as you know, the groups, the Leave groups and uh, the Brexit groups, could come up with another term rather than no deal. Hi there, um, I'm David Roberts. I was just going to ask, um, it's got, I found it very confusing what Parliament's position now is in <clears throat> how these discussions evolve. If we wind up with a situation where there were a no deal, would Parliament still have a vote uh, to say, no, we can't leave on that basis? That's my question. Hi guys, I'd just like to thank you for hosting this event. It's been most interesting. Um, this is less a comment and more of a question. And because, I mean, obviously you can tell I'm not from around here. And <laughs> I mean, when I, come to the, when I came to the UK a couple of years ago, I mean, I, there were a couple of things I missed. Good Halloween parties, plugs in bathrooms, and good snow. But um, one thing that I never thought I would miss is how democ the order of democracy, because I, I'm, I'm realizing that things are not done here like they're done in Canada. You have a vote, you implement the vote, you test it, if you're happy with it, the consequences thereof or the benefits, then you have a revote if applicable. That doesn't appear to be the order that people want to do things here, and I'm finding that quite an education, and it is truly most curious, because I've never in my life, I mean, we did the whole Quebec referendum years ago, and people were, you know, quite angry about it, and they were, they were a bit surly, but they, got, they accepted it. And I've never encountered a vote that people just would not accept. Outside of a banana republic, <laughs> and it's it's very interesting. As I said, you know, the idea that you 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 vote, you implement, and then you may change your mind after the fact, and that obviously is not necessarily how things want to be done here. So it's 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 been very interesting. So thank you very much. I think that the question about the parliamentary mechanism in terms of a people's vote, I think they are running out of time. The worry for me is that actually what we will start to hear more of now is extending. Article 50, and I really don't know how the EU would uh, take that, whether they would, because they would have to agree to it, all the countries would have to agree to it, but I wouldn't put it past them agreeing to that. But in order for that to happen, there would have to be a vote in Parliament, as I understand it, probably not needing to go to the House of Lords um, to actually say that we wanted to extend Article 50. But you know, you look at the, the majority, for the actual Referendum Act, to hold the referendum, when you look at the vote in the end in Parliament, it was 544 to 53. Article 50 was passed by 498 to 114. And the actual withdrawal bill, which was really, really crucial, got completely sidetracked by uh, the, those who wanted to stay, putting all sorts of ridiculous amendments, because it was a very simple bill. It could have been, Frank Field actually suggested it be a four-line bill, because really it was about simply saying, when we leave, we bring everything in, and then we start to decide what we want to keep. Even it went through its third reading in January by 342 to 295. And I, my feeling is, that no matter what, um, people outside Parliament are saying and trying to suggest, I actually think it would be very, very difficult to get a, a majority for delaying Article 50. I mean, I hope I'm right on that, but you're absolutely right. But my view personally is, although I don't want a, a, another referendum in any way whatsoever, 
although I like Gisela too, quite enjoyed it towards the end anyway. Um, the, the, I personally feel, um, and I was right on the referendum result, I called it on the Monday in the Daily Politics when the New Statesman political editor and the Spectator political editor both asked in the same programme as me, what do you think is going to happen on Thursday? And they said, oh, very quiet, you know, very sort of quite sad. The Spectator guy said, well, I thought, oh, Remain's going to win. New Statesman smiling, the uh, Remain is going to win. And I just interrupted and said, actually, Leave's going to win, and you two don't get out of London enough. And, and uh, um, so, uh, thank you. It's always interesting when you get the, the, the foreigner's view, because I sort of, you know, when I go back to Germany, they go and say, how can you? And I go and say, well, it's easy. But I was, I was, I was trying to explain to an American uh, uh, over the, the summer about this whole shenanigans about leaving or not. And it's funny, she said, so what you're saying is it's either get out or sell out. And I said, yeah, you've got it. <laughs> so, so I think this, this sort of not having the language of no deal, it's, you know, we're either going to get out, and if we're not getting out, we've sold out. Um, and in terms of the, the European Commission, the, the, there is talk of extending Article 50. It's actually, I've, I've, to my horror, discovered how easy it is to do it. It only requires a statutory instrument and a council decision. Uh, but, but, but the thing, the, the, the real problem is you've got European Union elections next year. And I think the minute you get into this, ne negotiating with a different set of people, different commission, a different European parliament, and the next European parliament will be, be by far more hostile to the European Union. I mean, just think, how do you think they're going to vote? Uh, what, what kind of MEPs Italy is going to return? What kind of MEPs Hungary is going to return? What kind of MEPs even Germany? Germany, the official opposition, the official opposition is now the AFD. So, and these are, these are elections on a proportional system. So I think there is a common interest to, to bring this. And for us is now the question to hold the nerve and sort of say, Free trade agreement, WTO terms, and that's why I come back to Mervyn King. Mervyn King was actually very helpful, you know. Um, the city, believe it or not, actually says, we just want to know what the rules are now, and then we're going to be okay. So but, but the key thing is don't blink, yeah. and we mustn't give them the excuse to blink. Thank you. Mick? I agree entirely that uh, I don't know about frightening ourselves unnecessarily about uh, a people's vote campaign. We certainly shouldn't be frightened if they, if they get away with it. The majority of Brexit will be bigger than, the, than it was last time if they were to, were to get away with their idea of the people's vote. I think people's um, uh, disenchantment with what has been done around Brexit and the attitude of the EU over the last two, two years would make itself uh, uh, felt in that vote. As for the unfortunate, you know, the kind of ugly side of the Brexit campaign, you've got a referendum campaign inv inviting, involving millions of people, it means that all sorts of arseholes get involved in it. Um, and it's very important to distinguish between that and imagine that that's had any influence uh, uh, on what happened. You know, the, um, this ridiculous attempt to find some scapegoat or excuse for why people voted leave, uh, you know, from, as Boney M would say, oh, those Russians, mm -hmm. to, um, you know, uh, the Cambridge Analytica people on, on, on Facebook or some other bloggers in their, in their back bedroom, in their mum's back bedroom who, who put something on Facebook. You know, that's why 17.4 million people must have voted for leave. We should be completely dismissive of all those ideas. In fact, um, in many ways, mo a lot of people voted, uh, um, present company accepted. A lot of the leave campaign, I think, was pretty incompetent, the official uh, uh, leave campaign. And millions of people voted leave in spite of that campaign rather than, rather than before it, uh, rather, than, uh, rather than because of it. So uh, I think we should have, uh, uh, give that no truck. One last point about... Uh, is it the question that we've now got the Tories as the um, Leave Party and Labour has remained? Very interesting because, as I was saying before, this is really cutting across old left-right party lines. I have no doubt that the Labour Party is now a Remainer party. All of their new support is from the metro, middle-class, hardcore Remainers. And the Labour Party is only going in one direction as far as this discussion is concerned. However they're trying to pay lip service to respecting the referendum result, that is the, re the way the wind is blowing quite strongly. The Tories are stuck in a very difficult situation because they find themselves as the completely reluctant, unwilling champions of leave. 
the last thing that you know uh, uh, that um, uh, May and Hammond want to be doing is is, is championing uh, um, uh, leave, and yet they find themselves attracting uh, those kind of support. So uh, the possibility of the whole of party politics being pulled about part by this, uh, how this uh, uh, ends up, I think is still uh, quite live, and something I would quite look forward to, actually seeing a complete proper realignment along the lines of what people actually believe in, rather than what colour badge they've been wearing for the last 40 years. Thank you. I agree with the gentleman there who said we should vote for something, people vote for something positive rather than something negative. In fact, it's my belief that the word Brexit itself, and I'm not sure exactly when it became, when it was coined, was one of the key reasons, well, certainly had an impetus that helped a Brexit to win because people were voting for something, for Brexit. And I think, really, we need to, we've got an overwhelming you know, corporate media-led assault 24-7. Every evening when I commute home from work, I open the evening standard. There's another scare story. I mean, it really is the bog standard, in other words, blue paper. Um, <laughs> that we need to build a positive image of that actually transcends left-right divides. Because it's about democracy. It's about elected government ministers being able to pass, make, draft up white papers with policy decisions that people have elected them on and not be told by their staff, oh, well, you can't do X, Y, Z because it contravenes a EU regulation or directive. And that could be something that benefits the country both from a left, more traditionally left perspective, for example, state aid for ailing businesses, or it could equally be something on the right hand, uh, more on the right free market side, of, for example, creating free ports in much of northern England, uh, in key leave voting areas like Tyneside, to try and regenerate those areas. So we need to work on building a, a really positive image. Uh, I think that's the message I want to make. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Paul Birch. If the campaign for the second referendum, for obviously that's what it is, as you yourself said, um, gains momentum, it gains traction, and it comes to pass, or we leave with anything other than no deal, which I think you're completely right, anything that is being offered as a deal is a complete sellout, um, why the hell should we just take to the streets? I want to ask a question about exhaustion, um, because I do think, I think someone mentioned that really what's happening now, the shenanigans, is really about exhausting us so that we, so it just doesn't happen. So I don't, I, I'm also more optimistic about a second referendum in many ways because I also think that we could win that. That would be less exhausting than just uh, plodding along and actually doing nothing through te technocracy, basically. Uh, and that's what I fear the most. Um, and I think in terms of the positive thing that we have to say, we have to say we are for democracy. That's what we're for. And all of this uh, attempt to exhaust us is anti-democratic. And so we are for democracy. So no deal is, as people, as Mick said, I think at the beginning, um, the only thing that's on the table that is democratic now. So we have to be for democracy. Uh, thank you. Um, so a couple of very brief questions. First of all, can we rename the people's vote to where I think you were getting to, Brendan, which is the loser's vote? <laughs> yeah. And just, I don't want to hear people's vote anymore. Um, also, I've had enough of no deal, and again, I don't respond well to acronyms. Most people don't. I like the term world trade. I like hearing those words. Can we talk going forward about a world trade deal from next March? No more, no deal. Uh, and also, third and final, given how keen continuity remain are to have another go, um, how about we give them one, but on a topic of our choosing, on, on a policy and a principle that the Leave vote actually enabled, and which would be impossible for them to win, one of equality. So from my perspective, as somebody who's not a British national, uh, and benefits from the common travel area, Kate, regardless of <laughs> where we get to, um, th from my perspective, the most fundamental question about living in the UK is actually whether you get to do it or not. As someone who was not born and bred here, 
So how about we adopt a policy where there is change Britain, leaves mean leave, constituency associations, trade unions, around having a non-discriminatory immigration policy, and then let count continuity remain, make the counter-argument, and see where it gets them. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'd like to know um, how much hope the panel places in this Jacob Rees Mogg, David Davis, Canada Plus, and, um, you know, do they think it's a good scheme, what they know of it? And if so, how will it get as far as Brussels? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in any handy tips for what we can do. And I've got a, a couple of things that I'd recommend. Uh, for a start, I'd say, uh, because we're all pretty much in agreement, but the, the thing is, I, I think, what are the things that um, we can do to actually make this come to pass? And I would recommend everyone do two things. If you've got any other suggestions you can throw in, I'd really like to know. But first of all, join all the political parties. I'm a complete slapper. I've joined several. <laughs> and... I, and and I've, I've joined them to vote for better leaders. Uh, I've joined them. It's strange, you, you join a party you actually loathe because you want to vote for a better leader for that party. But <laughs> d just do it. Honestly, uh, I, get, uh, uh, I get emails from uh, Philip Hammond and Theresa May, and it's nice to be able to reply to them and just give them a, just a pithy answer. And, um, and uh, so, yeah, join all the political parties and vote for the candidate, not the party, I'd say. And what I would also say is handy is um, uh, just pump the facts, because the facts are absolutely on our side, because there's no argument that someone else could govern us better than we could govern ourselves. So I would say, I would urge everyone to be very optimistic and because uh, it's a very big, technocratic, complex thing, uh, keep your answers very, um, <laughs> the opposite of my point here, but uh, keep them very concise and actually answer the point because it's a very complex uh, subject. But thank just you very much. pump the facts. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, I think one of our key challenges, um, going back to some of the comments that have been made this evening, particularly by Mick, is to present ourselves as being on the right side of history, not just the Democrats, but we have to show that, in fact, we are uh, internationalists, we're the opposite of little Englanders, we're the opposite of little Europeans. We have to drive home some fundamental facts. Uh, when I campaigned for Britain to join what was then the common market, it accounted for 30% of uh, world GDP. Today that's down to 18%. It's estimated that the EU is going to account for about 7% uh, within the next 20 years. EU exports only account for 11% of our GDP. What we export, only 40% goes to the European single market. That's going down every month because we export more and more to the rest of the world. So I think we've got to drive home those kind of facts to counter the, the campaign run by George Osborne and the Evening Standard, which, which says, you know, we're going to be plagued by Russian locusts and all the rest of it if we Thank have the temerity much. to honour the vote. Someone mentioned, uh, I think it was Mick, that uh, the, the, the referendum was won in spite of, uh, 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 you know, the, there was a lack of political leadership. It was one in spite of uh, the, the lack of le political leadership. And I just wonder how it is that we tackle that, because that seems to me to be the key difference compared to, say, for, for it, within Europe, where however much we might dislike the politics that's going on there around uh, uh, trying to get out of the EU, at least there's some sort of political movement. Manira, you, you talked about uh, wanting to have a, a, an atmosphere and uh, people uh, create a, creating a much bigger appetite for taking risks. I mean, I wonder how we do that and what that actually means, but how, how is it that we kind of regain political momentum around this? On a brighter note, in darkest Essex outside of London, plenty of Remainers that me and my Democrat colleagues speak to are now leavers because they're disgusted by the, by the, by the uh, attitude and, and the uh, deep cynicism of... Uh, of, of, of the remainers in that... And now, talking, and this is my question. Uh, I'm, for my sins, I'm in the Labour Party in South End, and last month, Progress put a, gen, a, a motion to our, our meeting through, a, a, through email, and it went through a lot of other party meetings as well, saying we should have a second vote, and all uh, um, Leavers are racist, white van man, and all the rest of it. And I have to say, I have to... Uh, I, Mike, I understand your nihilism, but I have to say, what happened in that meeting, we challenged the Blairite top table, and we overturned that vote overwhelmingly. Now, on Monday, they've now returned with another motion, <laughs> produced by 
progress and the Blairites that no longer control the party. You didn't know what you were voting for. We didn't, we were all... <laughs> And the chair of the meeting actually said, we have to realise in South End there are a lot of white van men. And, uh, as, and someone at the back said, why don't you just call them chavs? Because you obviously hate your electorate. Yeah. Now, on Monday, we had another meeting, and there's, there's a lot of influx of members, and they are very, very angry at being, having to have another debate and have to vote again on the question of whether the electorate are ignorant or not. And they will not knock on doors to say, you're a racist, ignorant, white van man. They, they want to represent their interests. So there is a, a, a movement inside the party that are sick and tired of this slow motion uh, um, Blairite coup against not only Jeremy Corbyn but any sensible politics in the, country, in the party to bring it back to Blairism and that's what it represents and that's the question I wanted to put to the Labour uh, MPs is this slow motion uh, coup can be stopped from progress because they are losing their momentum. Brian, you are a, a, another group of people who paid a huge amount of work and did a huge amount of work. We're really important in the referendum, um, all the, the trade unions against the EU and work that was done. Um, I mean, there is an attempt, and it's, I mean, it was uh, obviously was put through Vauxhall some, some time ago, a motion to, uh, to have a second referendum and to have a people's vote. And, and, um, but there it's very interesting because Vauxhall is actually in control of progress as well, but with Momentum working very hard to take over control in November at the AGM. I'm giving, giving out that now as a, as a, as a, you know, a fact. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, there's a little bit of, on, on the one thing on some of the issues that does unite them is, is the EU, I'm afraid. There is, there is a, a um, but I think that what you managed to do was pretty, Pretty amazing because you certainly wouldn't have got that in most inner London um, seats because most inner London Labour seats are um, constituencies um, are full of people who um, oh dear oh dear I've got to be careful um, who, uh, who who tend to work in certainly in, in in our inner city work in Parliament work in civil service work in um, charities and. Uh, uh, have a, a kind of attitude that, just like has been said, that if anyone who kind of dares to suggest that the EU might be a, a bad organisation um, is, is, is some kind of racist or, or um, even worse than that, um, if there is anything worse. But I, I, I just want to remind people who are not in the Labour Party but the, about the Labour Party history. And, you know, I, I, we lost two people... Uh, quite recently, that during the referendum campaign, if they'd been alive, would have been absolutely amazing in the campaign. One of them, of course, was the RMT leader, Bob Crow, who I did, I did um, way back when we were in the um, campaign to get a referendum, when none of us really thought we'd ever get it. I did a public meeting out in Bob Crow's area, and um, it was, it, you know, his, his, his passion for that if I could have just seen, and he was actually, um, I don't think it's a secret, he, he was quite friendly with Nigel Farage, and I think a rally with Nigel Farage and Bob Crow would have been unbelievable um, during the... And, of course, we lost, uh, we lost Tony Benn. And, you know, I look back on people like Peter Shaw, <laughs> Peter Shaw, and the person that I most identify with uh, was someone like Barbara Castle and you look at some of the speeches she made and a lot of them are now on social media you know the, the passion and everything that they said then about why it was not right to be joining the common market then just came through so well but Brendan do you want to add anything on the Labour side because you're just just um, just uh, not too much, but just a bit. It's um, we, we hear a lot at the moment. We're, we're told you know, the Labour Party is marching off in one direction, the Tories are marching off in the other, and there, there's this huge unrepresented centre ground of nice liberal people that just want a good life. Actually, the huge unrepresentative swathe of this country is the Leave vote at the moment. Yeah. On the estates, if you go to the Medway towns, used to be solid Labour, all voted Leave, turned away from the party. Go to the Midlands, Tories took seats like Stoke off of us. I mean, come on. Uh, <laughs> parts of the North and the Midlands under threat. Why? Because that working class vote that was always with us, it, you could weigh it. 
now marching away. Why? We're no longer reflecting their views. And I was very pleased that Spike published an article of mine today <laughs> highlighting some of this. And I think that's the huge gap that's missing in politics at the moment. And if we do, I think the, one of the a gentleman here suggested uh, Labour's becoming the party of Remain and the Conservatives becoming the party of Leave. If that really does play out, and I, I hope it doesn't, I think you could really see a seismic shift in the political landscape in this country, uh, whereby the Labour Party possibly goes the way of the old Liberal Party, loses touch with its core vote, loses touch with those it was set up to represent and face the consequences of history. It happened before, there's nothing, no, no party has a right to exist. And if we abandon those, it, it's happening. If, those part, if that happens, I think Labour could be in serious trouble. This week, the General Secretary of the GMB Union actually supports uh, a second referendum saying that we all were fed false promises. So there's a... Yeah, exactly. So there's some tough talking to be had with various so-called uh, organisations that represent working people. Manira. I mean, quite, like quite a few people tonight, I think that a second referendum could well result in uh, uh, an even stronger majority for leaving the EU. And we know that um, from the polling, you can never rely on polling, but the, the people who voted leave are pretty solid, actually. You know, our people are sticking to their guns. Um, and many more people feel strongly about the, the democratic um, uh, the democratic vote. So I, I think it's entirely possible that we would win a SEC referendum. Um, but, I, you know, I'd still rather we didn't have to do it. And I think um, one of the consequences of it, which may be a good thing, is that I think it would destroy the political parties. Not necessarily the appearance of them. I think they would probably just um, hold on the husk of... Um, of, of survival, but they would be very different parties, and the membership and the public's response to them would be very different. And I think for someone um, like me, who feels politically homeless, I, I don't really think any of the political parties currently um, respond to my views, not just on Brexit, on many, many things. I think that kind of shake-up is very exciting. It's worrying as well, and, and nerve-wracking, and you know, we're entering into completely different territory. Um, but I would like a political party that does reflect my views, and this kind of the stasis that we've had for such a long time. And many of my friends who are left and right, we find that we're making allies with people with completely different backgrounds. And I think that is a very interesting thing. Um, a few people have asked the question about what kind of deal should we be arguing for? And uh, you, know, you wouldn't start from this position. You, know, you would have started two years ago with a much stronger negotiating hand and much greater uh, gumption. It looks like Canada plus plus is you know, the kind of the aspiration that a lot of people are going for. But what I'm really critical about with this government is that it's essentially um, in its bunker worrying about the parliamentary arithmetic as if it's something that it cannot affect. God, how are we going to get this through? We can't persuade anyone. Uh, we just have to crawl out of here with the best that we can manage. And essentially what they've done is they failed to explain any of the options to the public and fought for any of them. They failed to explain what the, you know, the potential disadvantages of the Canada Plus Plus deal are and how they will mitigate them. So they've not said, okay, well, there may be some disruption to some businesses, but they are a minor part of the economy and we can deal with that. We can address those, those issues. They've essentially accepted all the criticisms of the options on the table and made it impossible for anyone to know, um, uh, you know, is this a, a, a way forward? forward. And that's, that's my main criticism. They've acted like they have no agency, as if they don't even run the country. And they do. And that's where I think we come in, in that we have to continue to make the case, both for democracy, but we have to really provide the ammunition, uh, the intellectual ammunition, that leaving is always going to be better than staying in uh, uh, on, on those terms. Thank you. Gisela wants to say a few words in reply to a previous point, and then I'll bring it all back yeah. to you. It, it's, it's the immigration issue, which I thought is, is worth coming back to, because uh, with Change Britain, we're doing a lot of focus group work, which is fascinating. And we've been doing some on immigration, and we take a group of Remainers and a group of Leavers. And on, on that question, we very deliberately don't do mixed groups. And it, it, it's hilarious. With, you say to the Leavers, what kind of immigration policy do you want? Uh, can, can, can you hear me now? No? Is it OK. So we say to the Remainer group, what kind, to, to the Leaver group, what kind of immigration policy do you want? And essentially, it is non-discriminatory. Uh, exceptions for Ireland, everybody accepts that the Irish relationship with the United Kingdom is a very special one, but other than that, kind of some sort of Australian point-style system. Then you go to the Remainers, and they're going to say, 
All levers are just racist. And he said, well, no, 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 no. All levers are just racist uh, and stupid. And you finally go and say, OK, OK, let's accept for the moment that all levers are racist and stupid. But what kind of immigration policy would you like to have? And do you know within a few, within a few sentences, they want a kind of Australian-style point system? <laughs> <laughs> So, and, and the, the, big, the big achievement of, of, of Brexit, I think, is that the subject of immigration in British politics has now become the responsibility of the front benches of the two main parties. We do not have the AFD. We do not have political parties which are only pursuing that. The mainstream has to take responsibility for the borders. And I think that is really important. Thank you. We're starting to tackle some very difficult questions here about what unites us and what doesn't unite us. But of course, this rally is about democracy and how we get together to advance that cause. So uh, focus uh, the points on that. But there's a gentleman in the middle who's been waiting a while. I think Mick is mistaken. If he follows my lead, goes next week down to Parliament Square, goes to Churchill's statue, he will see some incredibly moving words Britain that we all know. If Hitler invades Britain, it won't be that bad. <laughs> Giza and Kate, thanks very much for your uh, fortitude over the last couple of years. It must have been quite difficult. Now, uh, Nick Timothy came out last week um, moving from Czech, uh, Theresa's lapdog, moving from former lapdog, moving from Czechos to EEA. Um, and though I doubt anyone here knows him, there's a business journalist, Ambrose Evans Pritchard, who was formerly a Norway man and is moving very strongly for, for, for Canada. Do these kinds of shifts encourage the panel to believe that we could be doing, finally moving towards something that suits us, not Michel Barnier? First of all, I'd like to thank Gisela and Kate and Brendan and anyone that took part in the official uh, referendum campaign. I thought you did extremely well. You won. And then, you know, for that, given all the odds were against you, I think it's very sad if people think you did do a good job. You did, and you should be very proud of it. Uh, my name is Professor Alan Skell. Uh, one of the things that I did in the past was to find the UK independent. Uh, UKIP is now about as dead as the Chequers plan. Uh, so, as I do envisage some kind of political realignment taking place uh, after the, the immediate squabbles of the Brexit, uh, I've set up a clean Brexit party, and you can find out about it in cleanbrexit.com on the web, cleanbrexit.com. I do think we have to get together. I do think there will be a realignment. And I think we need a democratic, progressive, uh, non-racist, uh, pro-Brexit, uh, moderate but uh, reasonable, but also far-looking uh, party. And we've set out on that website a whole range of policies which I hope will appeal to people. But congratulations to the organisers. We all have to get together. What these are the Kate and others did during the referendum campaign. So I, I think we should get together and look at keybrexit.com. So actually I actually had a question for the uh, for the panel. The, the political dividing line in the country now seems to be between people who uphold democratic principles uh, and people who don't, uh, who are actively uh, trying to flout uh, the principles of democracy. That seems to be by far the, the biggest problem that we face. What should we be doing to aid uh, a political realignment that realigns British politics on the lines of people who are for democracy and democratic principles uh, and, and, the, and, and the people who are, are against it? What should we be doing to make that happen? Just on that last point, I think uh, political realignments uh, in this country are incredibly difficult to take place given our electoral system. Uh, we have a very adversarial uh, parliamentary system physically and, and also politically. Um, no party except for UKIP in the European elections last time 
uh, to beat Labour or Conservatives. Um, I think we're very fortunate in this country that we have two parties that do encompass a broad range of opinion. Um, I think what we need to focus on, actually, is something Giza just touched on. Actually, when you talk to people that voted for Remain, a lot of the things that Leavers believe in, they also believe in. Uh, only Leavers believe in doing it outside the European Union, and Remainers believe in doing it inside. Um, I think there needs to be an acceptance uh, by those very powerful Remain individuals with extraordinary wealth behind them, that the people who voted and you can't say, oh, well, we have a referendum again. What happens is you have a referendum, uh, you test it out, and generationally, if it goes barely up in 30 years, like, the country might change its mind. I don't think it will. Uh, but this argument that they deploy, that, oh, it's like a general election, you know, it happens every so often. No, what happens is a government gets it, it implements its policies, and after they've been experienced and tested, if we don't like it, we kick them out. Uh, you don't say, well, we voted them in, and now we've got to have a referendum on every single policy they put through. Um, so I think what's going to happen is an effort has to take place within political parties, within communities, trade unions, to try and get the acceptance of democracy. I personally don't think a big party realignment will happen. I think what will happen is the demographics that support uh, the two main parties will change. I think it is changing. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, again, going back to some of the uh, research we've done uh, for Change Britain, we did 4,000 interviews, 2,000 before the 2017 election, 2,000 afterwards. And what was really interesting is how the, the under 35s actually don't have, uh, have completely different political alignments. And they're, not, they're neither left nor right. But the one thing which struck me, which really puzzled me, was that they they didn't believe in the contributory principle, i.e. Don't, don't save for your pensions, because quite frankly, there's not by the time you know I might get to pensionable age, I'll have to work till I drop dead anyway. Uh, they absolutely fervently believed in the NHS, and they wanted to, uh, the thing which, which made me go, hmm, was they all wanted to nationalize the railways. And then I thought, are they Thatcher's children, or are they Corbyn's children? <coughs> And we did a bit more work, and I realized they were neither. They just thought the, the government was crap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so they said, railways uh, cost, costs me the earth, ru 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 rubbish, rubbish service, might as well nationalize it, can't be any worse. And the only institution which, strangely, they're really bought into, they wish to contribute to, because rich or poor, wherever you live, through the generations, were the hospitals. So hence the so so what I think is happening that the, the Labour Party is becoming like the American Democrats. So it's becoming a right space, uh, metropolitan, uh, public sector workers, universities, uh, and that is the real challenge because our now election system is the Labour Party is prepared to write off. I mean, Andrew Adonis last night on, on, on LBC said. If you want to, if if you don't want to, you know, if you want to implement Brexit, don't vote Labour. So I said, are you saying to the people in the northeast and the northwest and the local elections in May, don't vote Labour? And he said, well, no, not 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 if they they, they, they know they care about Brexit. And I said, we thought, how can we do that? How how can you have a Labour Party that is prepared to go for the margins of the vote because that's what it is and abandon the core, because we know exactly where the core's going to go. They're, that's where they went in the 80s, they went to Thatcher. So, so I think the realignment will be a regional, it will be intergenerational. And the thing which worries me, and I finish on that note, is that just like the second referendum, I, ha I have no fear of a second referendum, because I think we'd win it. But we would create even further divisions. And if, if the job of responsible politicians is actually to seek consensus, middle ground, and do things for the majority of the people. Creating further divisions is the last thing you should hope for. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in the business of trying to uh, predict what happens in politics, because I think that's just clearly I'm, I'm just as ignorant as anybody else. But, um, I think one, one thing that is striking is interesting that Gisa says that the, you know, there are so many Labour politicians who are cloth-eared about what the public is telling them. 
and what their own constituents are telling them. And I don't know if that's uh, a, a, a new phenomenon or if it's distinct to the Labour Party, but I do think that, um, from what I've observed, politicians are keenly aware when they're about to lose their jobs. And it does tend to uh, change um, the way that they feel about things, and they can do spectacular u turn I mean, Andy Burnham is a very good example. Andy, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I've, I've met him recently, I'm quite a as a person, but you know, he is well known for being a, a flip um, and I think it's interesting in the, in the Conservative Party that um, you know, my former boss, uh, Boris, um, he was a very, very low air, just at the point where he um, quit the leadership contest two years ago, and everyone thought that he was done for. Um, just because he resigned on the basis of Brexit and is now riding high, you find that in Parliament, politicians have a very different view of that. And it shows how fickle politicians can be as well. And I, you know, again, President Clinton accepted and who stuck to their principles. But um, this idea that having power and then relinquishing it or giving it up, um, it doesn't sit well with a lot of politicians. They like to keep their jobs. And uh, I think that, that one thing we could do is um, remind them of you know, the gentle political pressure of the public that voted for them. And things like Change Britain, um, which keeps the chairs, is really important for that because it is about constantly reminding them uh, that there is another countervailing pressure. It's not just about what's happening in the NEC or in their circles in Westminster is about ultimately what the constituents are like to do and um, you know I think the fact that the majority of people in this country in the last election did vote for parties that said that they would deliver Brexit I think is a, is a really important um, um, uh, argument. Thank you. Just on the question of political realignment I think it's important to recognise that it's happening um, and that's one of the reasons why politics and the elections have become increasingly difficult to predict. Um, from lean areas to remain areas, uh, it becomes very hard to know who's going to win uh, any particular election. No, that is happening, but it's happening within, almost within the kind of corpses of the old political parties, uh, rather than anything new emerging. And I think that's, until that happens, uh, we're going to be left with this extremely difficult uh, flux situation where, 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 where uh, there's no clear lines of, of uh, demarcation and battle. I, the thing that, I'm very optimistic about the, uh, what's happened with Brexit. The thing that, the only thing I find really depressing about it is, you know, this room is very unrepresentative in the sense that there are a lot of people in here who think of themselves as left-wing who are pro-Brexit. That is not what left-wing means in British political discourse now. The left are pro-EU and anti-Brexit. And it's, I'm very delighted that uh, Tony Benn got mentioned. Because, you know, Tony Benn is kind of put on a pin for many people who are kind of Corbyn supporters, but put on a pedestal. But at the same time, they actually forget and deny the whole Benite tradition on the European Union and, 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 and the Common Market. Even the Sun does. Yeah, all the yeah, Sun's confronted with this part of I've completely forgotten the way that Ben wrote about and talked about how being a Labour minister going to Brussels was like being a slave taken to Rome in chains to meet the end of Now, you don't hear that talked about in, in the great Tony Ben quotes that are knocking around in Corbynite circles these days. So, um, and when Ben and Foote uh, campaigned um, against uh, even membership of the common market in 1975 in the referendum, they were not in the slightest bit put off by the fact that they were in a minority and they were in a minority on the same side as Enoch Powell. You know, they were standing for the principle they believed in. And I think this is, this is what we need to, to uh, reintroduce, is the idea of radical Democrats, who regardless of who we find ourselves on the same side of, are prepared to stand up for what we believe in. And the left's abandonment of democracy is for me, and, 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 and it's attempt to cosy up to the EU is one of the most depressing features of, of politics and the most screaming need for political realignment I can think of. Hello, uh, Neil McRae, King's College London and the British Group. Um, I don't think there's much support here for the second referendum, but nonetheless people are talking about it, so it's become a thing. And I think we need to be very careful about this. We need to be very forthright in saying no to this people's vote crap. How on earth should Leave voters have to go out and vote Leave again when they didn't listen to us the first time? I work at 
the IEA. And um, I'm um, also very concerned, as, as uh, some of you have said, about um, the idea that they're, they're pushing it. It's impossible to move to, to um, leave the EU in the time, so we have to extend the Article 50, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think it's very important that the general public remembers that 60% of our exports already go on World Trade Organization deals. So we know how to do that. Our ports are set up. Anyone who exports already knows how to do that. Yeah. We already have the majority of our immigrants, including me, coming in under the visa system, the tier one, two to five visas. So we know how to do that. It's not like we can't do that. We already do it, and we do it for the majority of our immigrants. This idea that we will be floundering if we leave and we'll have no idea what to do is just rubbish. I, I talk, uh, I deal with financial services in my job, and I can tell you everyone in the city is ready to leave now. They have to be. They cannot wait for Theresa May to make up her mind. They've been ready for years from the day of their referendum. They've got small offices in the EU that they can they can back to back trades through. Thank they you. have done it all, and the very big businesses who sponsored the Remain campaign, they. Um, uh, already had offices there, with the exception of Goldman Sachs. Everyone else already had a completely Thank fungible you very much. office. Um, we're running out of time now, but I want to get you all in. So please keep your comments really short. My name's Kate, and I want to go back to Tether Kate's point very early on, that on the day after the referendum, our very big mistake was to relax. Um, and what I would like to hear is plans for next steps. Excellent, we've got this meeting now. Um, are the plans elsewhere across London? Um, and particularly, several people have mentioned going door to door, which certainly I did during the campaign. It feels urgently that we have to absolutely be going door to door saying yes. we've got to walk away if needs be. Thank As you. just been mentioned, we'll cope. With the current government uh, currently in charge of Brexit, does the panel think it might be um, beneficial if the Prime Minister were to change? And of course, the front runner is Boris. Um, do we think that would be a good uh, idea? Manira, do you trust him? I'm not sure I do. But, uh, <laughs> ben Hatfield, we all believe, I think, in the room that the elected politicians, the MPs, are not going to or are going to try and not honour the vote. Yeah? Um, at what, it's all going to happen over the next six months. At what point do we who voted for Brexit um, uh, 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 demonstrate in front of Parliament and force their hand? I'd ask the panel, what is the trigger, the moment, which particular vote, which particular kind of moment when 17.4 um, million people have the opportunity en masse to turn up in front of Parliament and say the sovereignty of the people is paramount, do what we ask you to do. When would you ask us to turn up? Thank you. Claire Fox, Academy of Ideas. I don't want to launch my own project fear, but I, um, first of all, I'm not convinced that they're going to deliver on Brexit. Um, I mean, what I mean is I think they will do anything and everything and anything and everything to not deliver. So whilst I'm not usually one of the pessimists in the room, I'm not feeling as though that's what they're going to do. Um, and people keep saying, oh, well, and I, so that's one thing. And I, and I fear what the consequences of that will mean. I mean, somebody sort of said, well, you know, take to the streets. I, you know, I'm, I've always been a bit of a revolutionary, so I quite like the idea. But what I'm, I'm actually anxious about is a kind of nihilistic uh, taking to the streets and a kind of real disillusion with democracy. Manira made the point, you know, can you imagine teaching British values? I mean, can you imagine ever trying to mobilise anyone to vote again about anything? Uh, it, what's the point, right? I mean, you know, and then people start saying, oh, we've got a problem of apathy amongst young people. You know, well, guess what? But, I, but, I, but more seriously, it'd be more negative than that. So that's the kind of downside of my contribution. On the more positive side, um, people have said we need to have the facts and so on. I, I don't think that's sufficient. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying don't use facts. Um, but what I do think we need to do is to 
paint a broader picture. I mean, Manera made the point about Europe. I mean, I think we need to talk about what's going on in Europe much more. And in order to do that, we have to know about it and we have to familiarise ourselves. And when I say talk about what's going on in Europe, I don't just mean the terrible issues in relation to the Greek um, economy. I mean the upsurge of a kind of anti-establishment demos happening all over the place. And guess what the politicians of those countries say? They say they're racist stupid, there might not be a bus involved, but there's the equivalent thereof in every single country. So what's happening is, on a positive note, that there is a rising up against technocratic treatment of people as though they are nothing more than ignorant just to be done to. People are getting a sense of themselves. That can go in the wrong way, and I know that there's some unpleasant movements that are reaping the benefit of that, but there's also some very positive things, and if you saw and see what's happening in Germany, people are being called Nazis and fascists and they're saying no we're not some of them might be millions of them aren't and so on and so forth so I think we've got to talk about that much more and I also think we've got to be better at talking about democracy you know we can all say we're Democrats but as people will say I mean Gina Miller's going to say she's a Democrat right the people's vote people I do Sky Paper Review with Ian Don he's forever going on about being a, a Democrat I'm the real Democrat Claire I, you can, we can't just all sit there going I'm a Democrat you're a Democrat I'm a Democrat you're in other words we have to read more about democracy I mean I'm the Academy of Ideas I'm going to say this we need to know more about we have to to make it come alive. We can't just talk about it, we know about the history of it. Talk, we have to basically over intellectualize it, out intellectualize it, and win the arguments that way, not just a load of facts and figures which will bore everyone to death. Thank you very much, and with your indulgence, I've already discussed this with David. Two points both practical. Quick, thanks. Yeah. Some people were asking, what can we do? What can we do practically? I can tell you that, um, that facts, for e facts for You have produced a Brexit back battle pack and toolbox, which tells you individually how you can campaign to honour the vote. It's currently, it's currently, I will give you the quickly. tag quickly, but I can tell you it's already been endorsed by Leave Means Leave, Get Britain Out, Better Off Out, Thank Fishing you. for Leave, Veterans and Bruges. Thank you very much. And the, you can go to <laughs> www.facts for, as a number, you, EU, dot org, dash, BBP. Thank you. This lady will be available at the end if you want to get the full details. Thank you very, very much. Hello, my name is Michael Lightsfoot. I got answers for Brexit going with Manic and one or a few other people. I'm really, really worried at this point about one particular thing. March next year, presuming we do leave, I don't want the history books to say, and it was eerily silent outside the gates of Westminster. I hope that a few people can turn up at that point. Yeah. I would Thank like you. Artists for Brexit to be part of that and the rest of you to be part of that. So just, just wanted to plant that seed. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm worried about you being too complacent about the people's vote because the, um, when you say, uh, I think we'll win it if we have to do it again, because every version of the people's vote I've seen is a three-way vote yeah. Yeah. where it's rigged so that Remain will win because, yeah. because the Leavers are going to be split. There's no version of the people's vote I've see, ever seen that, that's not three-way. And I, I worry that when you people like you say, oh, I don't care, bring it on, we'll probably win anyway, it's a bit of a hostage to fortune because when Nigel Farage said that, they were then, oh, Nigel Farage wants another vote. Nigel Farage wants one. But obviously he didn't say that. But I worry that when you say that, um, that will be picked out and represented like Good that. Good point, thank you. I'm Stephen. Uh, one element that hasn't been spoken to tonight when you talk about democracy, there's kind of like a sinister uh, narrative that I sometimes hear, that the old people have kind of stitched us slightly young folk up, uh, and I think that's quite sinister in our democracy. It's, it's, it's discrimination against older people, and it's wrong, and I think we need to stamp that out right away. <laughs> Hi, do you think Corbyn's been a bit disingenuous when he says that he wants to nationalise industry and at the same time remain part of the custom union when they don't allow state aid rules? 1975, we had a referendum. Some of us uh, 
campaigned in that one. Um, so this 2016 one was the true second one. Um, we had 40 years experience of the EEC, EC, EU, and that's what made us decide to leave. Now we need to keep campaigning hard, harder than ever, I think, to keep the focus on clean Brexit, independence, sovereignty, including defence sovereignty, which hasn't been mentioned, it should be, economic sovereignty, control of our laws, borders and money. Let's keep campaigning. Let's get on with it. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Um, before I bring back the speakers, there's a few announcements. Uh, one is from me, actually, which is that I'm so pleased to see a full house here, and I hope to see you all again at our next events. Um, I actually have a very positive view of building a, a campaign for democracy because, of course, anyone who campaigned for leave has already started that argument uh, around who controls us. Is it us or other institutions? Uh, now we need to do the campaign for democracy around uh, whether our votes should be honoured, and that can include anyone, whether they voted Remain or not. And so it goes on. So for me, I think we just have to build on what's already been started over the last couple of years. Uh, over to David for final words, uh, and then I'll bring in the speakers. I just wanted to uh, explain a little bit about uh, Invoke Democracy Now. So Invoke Democracy Now was uh, set up in the aftermath of the referendum campaign because we were uh, tired and uh, angered by the constant accusations that we were uh, too old, too racist, or too stupid to know what we were voting for. Um, I'm sure you're all, you're all familiar with that. I also felt that it was uh, right to organize uh, a rally for democracy. I think we all recognize that we're living through a crisis of democracy uh, when the largest mandate for uh, any, on any single issue in British politics can be postponed or can be disrupted or, uh, or even ignored, then we know that, we're, that we are experiencing uh, a real crisis. If you're here from a Leave campaign or a democracy campaign uh, and, you don't, and you're not already in contact with me, uh, make sure that you don't uh, leave the room uh, without introducing yourself to me. So to, so to kind of a borrower, a borrower phrase, um, I think that we're better together and I think that we can do more uh, together and if we pool our uh, talents and our resources uh, then I think we can uh, start, uh, start hitting home uh, some, of the, uh, some of the points that have been made tonight. And again, because we're not backed by millionaires, we need your money. So there will be people uh, with buckets uh, at the, uh, as, as you leave. So please, I don't want to hear change going in and out. I just want to hear the soft thud of... <laughs> Uh, fivers, teners, twenties uh, going in there. So thank you very much for coming and I'll uh, hand back to the speakers who you've actually come here to hear. So the speakers to sum up in reverse order, Mick. Uh, okay, one uh, small point and one bigger one. Uh, on the small point, is Jeremy Corbyn being disingenuous? Yes. 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 The rest of your question is not necessary. I think... Um, the idea that you can both, at the same time, uh, respect the referendum result and say that you won't countenance a no deal uh, is a complete contradiction uh, that he needs to be uh, had out and, and, and uh, brought to public book for. Uh, more substantially, people have talked about how can we put a positive case for what we mean by democracy and distinguish ourselves, our argument, at a time when the word democracy is used and abused uh, on all sides. So that, as we've heard, the people's vote, which is clearly an attempt to overturn a people's vote, uh, can pass itself off uh, in the language of, uh, of, of democracy. Well, um, what I have done with this since I wrote my book is to always go back to the, to the beginnings, or what democracy actually means, what it meant when uh, it was invented uh, in ancient Greece, where it was largely a, a boo word uh, uh, used by the elites. Nothing changes uh, there, but the two parts of democracy, demos, the people, and kratos, power. And the aim of every anti-democrat since Plato, right up to the Remain campaign today, has been to separate those two things uh, as far as possible. I think the great positive thing that the Brexit vote gives us, and the campaign for Brexit gives us, is the opportunity to bring the demos and kratos closer together and to change politics forever. And I'm quite happy with the slogan, uh, no deal, as long as it's no deal that sells short popular democracy. Thank you.
Two points for me as well. Somebody asked the question, do we need a different prime minister? I, w I, won't, I won't say um, who my preferred choice is, but I, I do think that the... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, actually, Gisela. Um, I remember after the... Um, <laughs> I do, I, do some, I do remember um, in the 2016 fated um, Tory leadership campaign, a few people who were very close to the main parties involved did say to each other, can't Giesler just do it? <laughs> He's so much better. Um, but I think you know, the, the, the main thing, um, and the, main, the main quality that uh, we need in a prime minister right now is courage. And courage is uh, a virtue that I think is, um, uh, is a, rare, a rare thing in um, political discourse today. We've seen some of the people uh, on this panel um, display that in, in spades in the last couple of years. But um, I think we, we need someone who has the courage and their convictions and has the courage to do things, which, to do something which is unknown. We're in unknown territory. Um, and they have to be able to, um, to, to hold their nerve. Um, uh, so I think uh, there's a very uh, a small field of contestants who could do that. Um, the, the, I'd also like to thank Dave and Invoke Democracy Now. This, I think this is the third event that I've spoken at for you. Um, and I'm sure there are better people out there you could get. But um, I, uh, I, I think it's fantastic that they are um, plugging away uh, and still doing this and bringing more and more people. The events get bigger and bigger. And I think it's a great idea to have a focal point that we can all think about. It's very hard to create a sense of urgency uh, with these things and to bring millions of people out onto the street. And it, you know, it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. People at the moment out there feel that, you know, it, it's not really something that they can affect. But if there, if there were, and I don't know what the answer is, I don't know what that date is, but I do think that that's a, a very um, good question um, to think about as we, as we leave here tonight. Just again, thank you very much for inviting us along. I just want to pass comment on this idea of us, we will definitely win a second vote if it comes along. I don't necessarily share that view. I think for many, many years, we assumed, well, Remainers assumed that they would win. It was all going to be okay, leave didn't stand a chance. And look what happened. We must never be complacent Remainers. We must constantly campaign for leave. And if one comes, we've got to put all our energy and fight into winning it. And if we do that, we will win. One thing we can all do, those pesky Remainers outside Parliament every day, shouting, waving their flags, I don't think it's legal to attach banners to public railings. If we could all write a letter to Westminster Council tomorrow morning and just say, look here, anti-social behaviour, littering with your leaflets every day. I, you know. <laughs> Have you already done it, Sharon? It's all right. Sharon's already done it. It's okay. <laughs> Munira has just given me another reason of why I should continue to break out in cold sweat every time I hear her voice. I'm going to let you into a secret now. She terrifies me. And she terrifies me because when we did the rehearsing for the, for the, for the Wembley debates and the other television debates, Munira was standing in for the other side. And then we were floundering, coming up, and there was Munira with this sort of precise, incisive questions. And I kept thinking... God, I wish that woman would just go away. I was actually better than Sadiq Khan. I think, actually, <laughs> yeah. I think I was more forceful than him. So, so Munir actually played a, a, a much underestimated role in, in, in our success. But I thought I'd finish on an exceptionally positive note in a slightly different one. Is if, if you want to support an, a, a Brexit here, go and buy yourself a fantastic book. It's Austin Mitchell's Confessions of a Political Maverick. Um, I just picked up my copy. I've known Austin for a long time. He's an exceptionally good writer. He also, I think, gives a, a kind of history of the, sort of the last 40 years of the Labour Party and someone who, how he saw it. So if you need cheering up, dip into Austin's book. And in the meantime, thank you for doing this and keep up the fight. Thank you, Lisa. Well, thank you. Um, and Kate. It's been a really, really useful to sit up here and listen to all the very, very useful comments. And I know all the questions haven't, haven't been answered. Um, one thing I would say right at the beginning, let's not forget that a lot of people who voted Remain are not part of the loser's vote. You know, they, there are a lot of people, and I meet them even in Vauxhall, who have said to me, you know, we voted to remain, we've accepted the result and we want to get on with it. So, you know, we, we must be careful in our language too on that. Um, I, 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 um, I've, but I also think we should have no truck. I, I, 
whilst I think we would win, we don't want a, another referendum because I think there would be division. They would have different things on the ballot paper this time. And, and I think we have to have no truck with them and we have to actually go out and argue all the time that that is a real, real uh, an attack on democracy to have another vote. I, um, I see these people, as Brendan was talking about, as I walk past Parliament regularly, I'm usually shouted at and called a traitor. Um, I mean, I think it's quite interesting that, you know, we're, we're, we're traitors, whereas the 17.4 the million people, you know, are, are, they, are the majority, and the real traitors are those people who actually are trying to deny uh, the will of, of uh, the majority. Just one very quick thing, because it didn't come up tonight, but let's nail the complete nonsense about the Irish border. You know, there is a, 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 a cust there is a border there at the moment. You can't see it necessarily. There are cameras at the border. There are excise duties that are different. There are people get stopped regularly for smuggling fuel or smuggling cigarettes when the, the, the excise duty has been different. It is absolutely been made into a, a, a huge shibboleth just to stop Brexit. And the idea that, that we can't have any of these things because it, unless the Irish border is, is, is sorted out is, is absolutely ridiculous. And I think we're beginning to see that that is being uh, challenged now. And that really is my final point. We all have to challenge and speak out. Sometimes it's difficult because you're in, a, in with people um, you know, who, who, are, who are very, in London can be very, very, very um, anti uh, what, what many of us believe in here tonight. But we have to, be, we have, to have that courage and we have to take, take them on. And we have to take them on in the media, we have to take them on in the radio phone-ins, we have to take them on in the letter pages, and we haven't really got to and ever think that by just sitting back, we all sat back for too long, now is the time to actually get out there and make sure that we're making the case for true democracy. And I think this is a wonderful title, honor the vote, avoid the loser's vote, and let's go on to getting an independent United Kingdom as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you to the speakers and thank you to you. See you all again.